carbohydrate intake sir so carbohydrate Sorry? intake if it is reduced yeah and of course body weight is maintained yeah and regular exercise walking if you are overweight reduce weight and do some de stressing like pranayama and all that yoga or pranayama this will help to prevent uh, more than 50 to 60% of cases or at least delay it by 10 15 years if the genetics is very strong ultimately it will come but it will be so mild right, it, after 60 it's usually so mild that it doesn't affect your lifespan doesn't affect doesn't produce kidney problems and the younger you get it then you are in trouble Yeah, sir. But why it is coming now? I mean, the VA Indians are Indians, and today also, fifty years, hundred years back, were also Indians. No, okay. but there were there were many reasons. Number one, uh, obesity was not so common. If okay. you go back in okay. our generations, if you see, uh, one or two, one child in a class will be obese. Right, sir. Today, sir. in my grandson's class. Out of let's say fifty children, thirty-five to forty are obese. Okay. So that is a huge difference. Number one. Number two, we in our days we used to eat out like once a month. Also, is rare. Rare. You eat twice a year. Twice a year. It's it's echoing. I think that. Yeah. yeah. Two, two, Sorry, sir. Uh, Somebody no, has. No, yeah. No, yeah. There are two instruments of. so uh, that is a huge now today four times a week they are eating out and the other three times also they are not uh, thing then uh, stress levels have increased sleep has got disturbed then obesity is increasing physical activity has gone down uh, everything is mechanized now these are the drastic changes which took place after uh, took place after 1991 after india opened up its economy suddenly the economy increased people started earning more buying cars see earlier everybody was either cycling or going by walk or bus or how many people had a car you know in a locality one or two will have a car you know everybody has a car everybody has a two wheeler even to go to the market which is next door they are using uh, you know scooter and going so that is a huge decrease in physical activity so that is what has caused it and all this happened over 10 20 years time and then the food started getting see when we used to eat it used to be wholesome food brown rice whole wheat it used to be like that today it's all polished rice and wheat is highly polished wheat flour uh, so that is another uh, cause then the actual sugar intake has gone very high due to the junk foods so a number of causes are are there but that underlying susceptibility we always had but it was not coming out earlier now it is coming out at a very young age that is a problem yes. we do not have uh, these uh, what you call cars motors uh, physical activities more like say himachal pradesh Ah, ah. Uh, there is a lot of physical activity. There is no much uh, uh, motor transport available. People still go and walk for. They still carry on the same activities. Well, Even, now compared to earlier, ah, uh, maybe little less, but still much, much less, sir. Much less. There's a huge difference. See, if you take uh, villages and all that in those days, first of all, is agriculture. people used to manually work in the field today they are sitting on tractor and easily they can get loan so everybody is buying a tractor they are sitting on that and then they are going everything is mechanized so that's yeah. a huge change even in the rural area urban areas see earlier you had to walk to the bus stand then from there catch a thing then again go to work again walk today everything you know has become so near for everybody metro has come this has come that has come everything is making life easy it's not that life should not become easy but when life becomes easy like that we have to burn the calories and we have to take extra effort which we are not doing we are eating more and doing less physical activity that adds up the calories add up the fat uh, you know get, accumulates in the abdomen fatty liver which uh, you are seeing so much 
fatty liver where was the fatty liver those days today everybody's got fatty liver no so that is where insulin resistance comes so it's a yes, series sir. of factors but it's preventable and reversible even today if we take uh, active steps we yes, can sir. prevent it and reverse it uh, to a large extent sir dr jayachandran good evening sir good, good evening good evening sir good evening sir good evening. Very yeah. happy to see you, sir. You Thanks. wanted to see ask you. some question, please. Yeah, please. yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. sir definitely, sir. The we'll last, sir. <laughs> your <laughs> light, you, sir? your light is coming from behind. So yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, 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 turn it a little bit. We can see your face. Yes, sir. Definitely, sir. Much yes, better sir. now. Much better now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sir, the issue is that. Uh, I am mean, asking some very layman questions as yeah. far as diabetes is concerned. Okay. Now, say for example, about 25 to 30 percent of our population is below poverty line. Huh. They don't get food even. They don't get even 2,400 kilocalories. Yeah. And they do work for the each and every activity. They don't have any cash to go and utilize the uh, transport. Correct, correct. Even so, them, so, no, there, there it's very low, sir. For example, when we did India, uh, in the India study, we had done the whole country, represented yes, a sample sir. of every state. When we did rural Jharkhand, uh, of course, this is 10 years ago, uh, yes, uh, because the study took 10 years to complete all of India. So, in the first round, when we did uh, Tamil Nadu, Jharkhand, Chandigarh, and Maharashtra, they're the first four states. This is exactly 10 years ago. That time in rural Jharkhand, we didn't find a single case of diabetes. And they were very, very thin. So we thought something wrong with the machine. Why we are not picking up even one case? Because Maharashtra we're picking up, Chandigarh we're picking up, Tamil Nadu we're picking up. Jharkhand alone we are not picking up. That too only in rural Jharkhand. Urban Jharkhand, uh, like a city, we are picking up. Uh, all the steel plants and all that we are picking up. So we went and asked the doctors there who are practicing in that area. How many yes, cases of diabetes you have seen in the last six months? They said zero. We don't see diabetes at all. We were shocked because, you know, within India, here is one state having 10%, 20% diabetes. Other state in rural areas near zero. Finally, when we finished in Jharkhand, it was only 3% of uh, Jharkhand which had uh, diabetes. It was so low. Similarly, if you see Bihar, very, very low. Northeastern states, very low prevalence. Whereas now, when you finish the later states, Kerala, Puducherry, and uh, Goa, it's about 22% of the whole state, not city, whole state, urban, rural, everything uh, put together, more than 20% having diabetes in Kerala. So the differences within India are huge. It's really huge. India is not like one uniform place. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir, for joining. <laughs> Dr. Sarin has also joined, sir. I know, I know. I just saw him. I said good evening to him. <laughs> Shall I just try sharing my slides? Yes, uh, you can. I'll try. And then I'll minimize it. Thank you. Yeah, it's seen now. Yeah, oh, you can see thing. that. Oh, okay. I'll now minimize, stop share. Yeah. Another five minutes, sir. We... No problem, no problem. We'll wait. Yeah, I just tested it. Oh, uh, we are uh, live telecasting it through YouTube. Oh, and, very, good. very uh, good. Yeah, so there are about 300 people who have joined on that YouTube. Very good. And uh, as far as uh, we don't do it really, we do online. So okay. that's a, uh, yeah. And it will so, be uh, stored in YouTube? Yeah. So, so what we do is that uh, yeah. all your slides, yeah, uh, we would be able to put in the virtual library on the NAMS library. Okay. NAMS website. It's a we have an e library. Okay. And uh, there we put your uh, say uh, slides. Yeah. Your full presentation. Plus, we also try to put down okay. the link for the YouTube. Okay. This is what we are doing it for all the programs which we Wonderful. have. So that uh, people have a benefit of uh, going there and having a look at it. Oh, yes. That's what it is. Sir. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have your lectures 
you can sure, sure. and uh, i can give any any time you let me know of another two months later or three months later if you want another couple of uh, lectures i can schedule them not an issue at all today i'm covering mostly the treatment part next yes, time yes. i'll cover prevention epidemiology any other uh, aspects that you monogenic diabetes there are so many other aspects which uh, we can cover yes hello good dr virada how are you <laughs> yeah good evening good sir virada from fine. gulbarga <laughs> his son was also my student <laughs> <laughs> yes good evening sir good evening good evening good evening, good evening dr jayachandra very good, nice. good evening sir good evening good sir good evening. very nice to see you <laughs> yes, sir thank you very much sir for your so, now over to our friend umesh and you and preeti can you start yeah preeti uh, good evening one and all i welcome you all today's uh, to today's navigate medico cme program i would now like to invite uh, professor umesh kapil sir the secretary of national academy of medical sciences to provide the welcome address good evening sir good evening and uh, good evening good evening star to all the respected uh, participants and the speakers honestly it's a great day for nams to have uh, dr mohan as a main speaker on diabetes and i am so impressed looking into the cv and the contribution which dr mohan has made in the field of diabetes globally it's not only in india globally he is respected for his work he has collected the scientific evidence not only the theory but he has theoretically proved it and then collected simultaneously the scientific evidence to show what works what does not work i think so that's a, sir my <laughs> humble pranam to you and uh, we would like to have a series of lectures on diabetes so that we'll discuss you separately that what are the important topics which we can sure. have five seven ten topics mm -hmm. every week we can have topics so that no uh, people, people are aware about the field of diabetes similarly we have uh, dr uh, sunita mittal she was uh, she is the chairperson of the second lecture which we have and uh, she has been my neighbor for 15 years mm -hmm. our children grew together mm -hmm. that's a great great uh, uh, love and affection which we have with each other and uh, so she would be sharing the session and uh, the third uh, uh, the main speaker over there would be dr peeki uh, and she is the head of uh, gaini in uh, Uh, she is the head of the department at the Lady Harding Medical College, and uh, I'll ask the Preeti to introduce you. And we have been helped by a team of uh, volunteers. Preeti is an assistant professor in psychiatry, and she has done her DM in uh, de addiction, and now she is planning to open. a department a unit in the aims on the uh, what's the geriatric, geriatric uh, uh, psychiatry is another area is something which is very important all right over to you preeti please come thank you sir now i would like to invite uh, professor sivsarin sir to provide uh, to give his remarks Uh, Dr. Sivsarin Sir is the President of National Academy of Medical Sciences, and he is also the Director of uh, Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences. Over to you, Sir. Uh, thank you, Neet. Uh, it's a great day for us that we have excellent speakers, Dr. Mohan and uh, Dr. P K, and also we have Dr. Sunita Mittal. I'll briefly give you an idea of Navigate Medico CME. this is national virtual graduate medical cme the whole idea is can we navigate people for excellence 
maybe the postgraduates to become super specialist, the postgraduates to get more skilled, and maybe those who are not in the academic field, such as RMOs or CMOs or district hospital people, they can also learn by joining. So this is an overarching Navigate Medico CME program. We have from January done about six such programs of two hours each. We want to learn. We would like the feedback from each one of the uh, participants. It's a very interactive session. You can put on the chat box your questions. The excellent speakers will try and answer them. And if not, we'll come back to you again. I would also like to thank the speakers and the chairpersons for their time. And I would give back to Preeti to continue the program. Thank you all and welcome on behalf of NAMS. Thank you, sir. Now I'd like to invite the speaker for the first session, Dr. V. Mohan, sir, who is a chairman and chief of diabetology at Dr. Mohan's Diabetes Facility Center, Chennai. Dr. Mohan oversees a chain of 50 diabetes centers across eight states of India and has over 5,85,000 registered diabetes patients in the electronic medical records of his centers. He is also chairman of the Madras Diabetes Research Foundation, which is Asia's largest standalone diabetes research center. His main research interests are epidemiology of diabetes and its complications, genomics of diabetes, including monogenic di uh, diabetes, type 1 diabetes, fibrocalculus pancreatic diabetes, precision diabetes, and nutrition in diabetes. Dr. Mohan has published over 1,560 papers in peer-reviewed journals, which includes 1,000 original articles. His research has attracted over 1,76,000 citations and has a Hutch index of 145. Dr. Mohan is ranked among top 2% of scientists in the world and among top 0.1% of researchers in type 2 diabetes by experts, experts Cape, which is PubMed. He has received over 200 awards, including the prestigious Dr. B.C. Roy National Award by the Medical Council of India and the B.R. Ambedkar Centenary Award, the highest award for biomedical research given by the ICMR. He was conferred the Dr. Harold Rifkin Award by the American Diabetes Association. He was also conferred FRS from the Royal Society of Edinburgh for his extensive contribution in the field of diabetes. In 2012, Dr. Mohan was also awarded Padma Sri, one of the highest civilian awards given by the Government of India. Dr. Mohan's autobiography, Making Excellence a Habit, The Secret to Building a World-Class Healthcare System in India, was published by Penguin India. His latest book, Banting, Bows and Beyond, was published by Nosen Press. Both are bestsellers on Amazon. On Amazon. We are privileged to have you here, sir. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just share my screen now. Is it seen? Yeah, I see. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Serene, Dr. Umesh Kapil, and the organizing committee of this meeting. It's a fabulous idea to, to bring together uh, people from India who have uh, done work in, the, in various fields and uh, update the members and fellows of NAMS and also other doctors who are invited for the CME series. Uh, so when Dr. Serene called me, a few days ago, I was absolutely honored and delighted uh, to be here. So thank you, Dr. Sareen, for also taking time to be here for this program. Dr. Umesh Kapil, thank you for all the kind words. Um, so the uh, what I'm uh, going to talk is approach to a patient with diabetes. Now, diabetes is a very wide, uh, wide subject, and therefore you can't obviously do justice to all of them in, uh, in, in one lecture. So today I'll focus more on the management of uh, diabetes, talking a little bit about diet, a little bit about exercise, but mostly about the pharmacotherapy of diabetes, various drugs which are used in the treatment of diabetes, but that is what a practitioner needs first when you approach a patient with diabetes. But in future lectures, I'll be able to talk about prevention, about genomics, and, and various other uh, aspects of uh, diabetes as we go along. I have no conflict of interest to declare. I, I do work with various pharma companies, but I'm covering all the drugs in diabetes. So this is not oriented towards any uh, particular uh, talk or any particular drug or any particular pharma. Now, let me just start with uh, the first slide, just to give you a background that diabetes is not one disease. 
we have uh, type 1 diabetes, which is uh, uh, a predominantly due to beta cell destruction. This can occur in adults, it can occur, but mainly in children, uh, type 1 diabetes occurs. And here, what happens is that the beta cells get completely knocked off. Within a period of 10 days, 15 days, one month, two months, all the beta cells are knocked off. We won't go into the etiology, we'll talk about that later. But if even within that, there are two types. One is called as the immune-mediated type, and the other is the idiopathic type of uh, type 1 diabetes. Then type 2 diabetes is what we are going to talk about today. Type 1 diabetes is a completely different approach. It, the only treatment available is insulin. And all about insulin and how it is delivered. And today with the pumps which have come and the patches and everything else, that will be a completely different story. I won't go into that. I'm going to talk about type 2 diabetes because 90% of all diabetes in India is type 2 diabetes. So when you, call, when you say diabetes without any other qualification, you are talking about type 2 diabetes. Now here, you can have insulin resistance as the main factor and some amount of insulin deficiency as well. Just for completion's sake, there are so many other types of diabetes. When you say diabetes today, there are at least 40 or 50 different types of diabetes. This is a long list. I'm not going through all of them, but each one of them to specialist centers like ours, we get all these types of diabetes and they, each one of them has their own peculiarities, their own etiopathogenesis, its own prognosis. And I have data on almost all these forms of diabetes, but I won't talk to you about that. The last one is gestational diabetes, which occurs during pregnancy. And that's a complete talk uh, by itself because some very exciting things have happened in gestational diabetes. In fact, we're just waiting for a paper to get finally accepted in uh, New England Journal, uh, which will change the way gestational diabetes is managed. It's under review. Uh, we are hoping it will get accepted now. Uh, and uh, early gestational diabetes, a new entity itself has been uh, described and the approach to that and a randomized clinical trial uh, on this. But all this I'm not going to talk about today. We are going to focus on type 2 diabetes, because that itself is enough for this that, uh, uh, time which is allotted to me. So I'm going to start with one simple question. Are all type 2 diabetes the same? Very relevant question, because until about, say, five years ago, all the guidelines, American Diabetes Association guidelines, RSSDA guidelines, uh, European Association guidelines, International Diabetes Federation guidelines, had one approach to type one to type 2 diabetes. You start with metformin. Diet, of course, diet exercise. That doesn't work, metformin. That doesn't work. They gave you uh, six drugs and said you choose from any one of them. Anything is all right for type 2 diabetes. In other words, type 2 diabetes is being treated as if it is one disease. Today, we know it's not. There are different subtypes of type 2 diabetes, and there are some subtypes which we have described in India, which are peculiar to South Asia. I'll probably just touch uh, on that. Now, where does the variability come? BMI. You can get people who are very obese because type 2 diabetes is almost always associated with obesity, but you can get people with type 2 diabetes who are not obese. They are of normal body, ideal body weight. Then you can get people who are lean. In fact, there's lean type 2 diabetes. Dr. Siddharth Das from Odisha and our group described this in 1998 itself. We had a paper showing that lean type 2 diabetes. At that time, the Americans objected and said, how can you have lean type 2? Type 2 is always associated with obesity. Well, in India, we had, <coughs> just like uh, Dr. Sarin, I'm sure, will agree that you have lean NAFLD. Not necessarily that NAFLD has to be only with obesity. So these are the variations that we see uh, in India, where a BMI can be very low. Then age at onset. Traditionally, we believe that type 2 diabetes comes after 40, 50, and so on. In fact, it can come even at 70, 80, and all it can come. But the age at onset started coming down. 50s, 40s, 30s, 20s, teenage. Today... My youngest patient of with type 2, I'm not talking about the type 1 insulin dependent, type 1 diabetes. I'm talking about type 2 diabetes with obesity is at age 7. Can you beat it? At 7 years of age, fat child comes with all the features. Already cholesterol is high and LDL is high and fatty liver is already there. And at age of 7, you know, they have acanthosis, nigricans, and they have all kinds of insulin resistance and everything. So that extreme also is occurring now, age at onset. Then you have response medication, varies considerably. You can give somebody two grams, three grams metformin, nothing happens. 
you give 500 milligram metformin to somebody they are purging away having diarrhea and vomiting and uh, uh, bloating and everything so this we know has a pharmacogenomic basis and uh, we won't get into that but we'll talk about it susceptibility to complications there are people who after 50 60 years of type 2 diabetes they have no complications at all they're doing very well absolutely nothing eye is okay kidney is okay everything is okay 60 years over in fact my harold rifkin award is uh, for that because we are the first to show 50 year 60 year survival in type 2 diabetes so that is possible. There are people who within two years can go blind due to diabetic retinopathy. Kidney will begin to get affected. You may say maybe they had it long. They're only 16 years old, 18 years old. How long they could have had it? Their known diabetes is at the age of 12 or 14. They could have had it when they were 10. They could not have had it before birth. You know? So there are some who are very prone to complications, others who are not so prone to complications. So with this background, uh, in 2020, we did a what is called as using a machine learning approach and artificial intelligence approach. We did a, a clustering of type 2 diabetes. So it had already been described from Scandinavia. But when we tried to replicate what was done in Scandinavia in India, it was totally different in India. So we said, OK, we have to start all over again. We showed the how if you use the Scandinavian method, what was uh, what we were getting. And then in this paper, we use what's called as K clustering. <coughs> Excuse me. And then using this K clustering, we found out what are the subtypes of type 2 diabetes. I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, just to show you that there are four distinct subtypes of type 2 diabetes. And this has relevance uh, in relation to treatment of diabetes. For example, there is a severe insulin deficient diabetes. These are very thin people. I remember I told you that BMI can be very low. That is in this group. Okay, About a quarter of people in India uh, have uh, this. This is based on a study of 20,000 people with diabetes, by the way, new onset diabetes for 20,000 people. So it's not a small study. So about a quarter of them had severe insulin deficient diabetes. They were thin. They got it when they're young and they don't respond very well to metformin. Their C-peptide levels are low. They don't have fatty liver. And this is one type of diabetes. The opposite is the ones who come with obesity, they have fatty liver, uh, they have um, the insulin resistance, uh, their waist is high, their BMI is high, the C-peptide is high. So you need a sensitizer here to treat these people. Here in the SID group, you need a secretagogue to help them to improve. And then something very interesting came. In the Scandinavian report, or until then the world literature, this third entity called a CARDD, which is combined insulin resistant and deficient diabetes. This is something which we picked up for the first time in South Asians. <clears throat> and the reviewers initially said, oh, well, they haven't reported. So we said, so what if they are not reported? This is an Indian one and 12% of people are having it. Now, what is peculiar about these, this group is that they had both insulin deficiency as well as insulin resistance. But more peculiar than that, is that they had the lowest HDL cholesterol. We know that Indians have low HDL cholesterol. That's part of the Asian Indian phenotype. But these people have exceptionally low HDL cholesterol and the highest triglycerides. So if all these people have a mean triglyceride of say 160, 180, these people have mean triglyceride of 350, 400. That is a mean of this particular group. So they have severe dyslipidemia and therefore they are more prone to develop both retinopathy as well as nephropathy and also liver disease because uh, they have such uh, high lipids and then finally they have we have this fourth type of diabetes called as MART. MART stands for mild age related diabetes this is what i was uh, just telling uh, 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 dr mesh kapil in the, the beginning these are people who get due to age so after 60 65 years if you see in india india as a whole especially in the metropolitan areas delhi bombay calcutta hyderabad where we have the data, almost 40% of people have diabetes and another 20 to 30% have pre-diabetes. So almost 70, 75% of the population at age 60 has either diabetes or pre-diabetes. But these people have milder diabetes. They have high HDL. They don't have much of dyslipidemia, which is why they live so long. And their lifespan is not affected. And they very rarely develop complications of diabetes. So you can treat them very mildly. You don't have to over-treat them. You just give them a little metformin and they're fine. And this is about 35% of all the patients that we see. So these are the four subtypes of uh, type 2 diabetes. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a little cough. Okay. 
now let's go on uh, i think that's enough as a kind of a background i have to get into the main subject now about the management so in the management of diabetes remember that although i'm going to talk mainly about medicines medicines form the fourth pillar of diabetes of type 2 diabetes in the case of type 1 diabetes it will be the main thing that's insulin don't give insulin they'll die but here in type 2 diabetes diet forms the first pillar <laughs> exercise forms the second pillar education forms the third pillar and medication forms the fourth pillar i'll briefly talk about these two and then go on to medications now we all know that one of the drivers of the epidemic and i'll talk about that we have a lot of data original data from india i'm not going to talk about that today but we know that excess carbohydrate in the form of rice and in the south and in the east and northeast and polished wheat and that is wheat flour highly polished wheat flour in the north and the west are one of the drivers of the epidemic this we have shown through cross section studies longitudinal studies prospective studies and so on now we did a you know based on the entire indiab data what we did was we did mathematical modeling saying how much of carbohydrate do you have to actually reduce to prevent diabetes or to reverse diabetes if you already have diabetes and that is what this paper is about and this has been making a lot of noise in the literature <coughs> so it turns out that <clears throat> currently we are taking 60 to 70% of carbohydrate the whole population of india <clears throat> any part of india if you reduce that by about 10% and bring it down to say between 50 to 54% that's all that is needed and what will you compensate it with with protein so increase the protein intake in the form of vegetable protein bengal gram green gram black gram or uh, tofu or paneer or milk or non if you are non veg then even non veg fat can remain the same but you should take healthy fats instead of taking saturated fat switch over to mono unsaturated fat and of course the fiber content also has to go up if you do this what we have shown is that you can either reverse diabetes or you can prevent diabetes how do you explain this to patients very simple what we normally do is when you take a plate thali we fill it with either rice or with chapatis that's what you should not do the first half of the plate should be filled with vegetables of different different colors this will give you all the vitamins you need the b12 you need the iron you need and all the nutrients you need the next quarter of the plate should be kept for proteins preferably from vegetable proteins but egg is fine milk is fine fish is good red meat you should avoid okay so all other but if you're taking from vegetable protein you have bengal gram green gram black gram rajma so many types of uh, legumes and beans which you can add so quarter of the plate should be kept for that only in the last quarter of the plate you need carbohydrate you may say why do you need carbohydrate at all why don't you el eliminate it completely it will not be a balanced diet we do need some amount of carbohydrate in the diet so instead of reducing drastically from 60% 70% to 10% 20% which is not sustainable all we are saying is reduce it by about 10 to 15% re replace it with good quality protein so this simple thing i'm showing you because it's very easy for you to teach your patients when they come to you saying that half the plate is vegetables quarter the plate is protein and only quarter the plate is uh, Uh, carbohydrate this simple thing will help you to control your diabetes it will help you to prevent your diabetes going from pre diabetes to di to diabetes and in early case of diabetes even to reverse it because the carb content is going down okay i'm not going very deep into diet we can do that the next time because i want to talk about medication today exercise exercise is the second pillar it's the most very very important it not only helps reduce your sugar it uh, reduces your cholesterol more importantly it increases your hdl i just mentioned that hdl cholesterol is very low in indians and the triglyceride is very high so to reduce that one of the most powerful things you have today is exercise it also helps to reduce fat visceral fat 
it increases muscle mass, increase, decrease insulin resistance, and of course, it helps to reduce stress as well. So exercise is a must. It must be done every day, and there are different components of exercise. To remember easily, I have uh, put this as what is called as the FAR principle. This is something which I coined, F-A-R, so that people will remember. What is F-A-R? F stands for flexibility. You must be able to stretch, you must be able to bend, you must be able to do the kind of drill which you used to do in school, especially in older people with type 2 diabetes. Very, very important to add flexibility. This flexibility should be done every day if possible. The second thing which you should do almost every day is aerobic exercise. This is the choice of the patient. It can be walking, it can be swimming, it can be cycling, it can be jogging, it can be badminton, it can be tennis, it can be anything, dancing. You know, in fact, my daughter has uh, evolved a, a, a dance form, H-I-I-T, called Thunder, which is making a lot of waves now. They're set to Bollywood dance. 12 minutes is all you need. Your whole exercise for the day is done in 12 minutes. And adolescents and youngsters love it because they don't have to go and walk, boring walk. They can just do Bollywood dance and it's just 12 minutes. Anything is all right, whatever you like. Resistance training is also important as you grow old because we lose muscle. So we develop sarcopenia. So to prevent sarcopenia, especially in the shoulders and in the thighs, we tend to fall, we trip and fall as we grow older because our muscles are not strong enough. So that at least twice a week, you don't have to do big weight lifting, but small dumbbells, weights, or some weights for the upper body as well as for the lower body and for the core. So remember the FAR principle, flexibility, aerobic exercises, and resistance training. For each of this, we have scientific evidence that it works. Now let me move on to pharmacotherapy of diabetes. Now, today we know that in the last 10 years, we've realized Earlier, we used to talk only about the pancreas, the beta cell. Later on, the alpha cell also came into prominence. But today, we know that there are at least eight defects as far as diabetes is concerned. Liver is very important. Hepatic glucose production increases, and that produces insulin resistance. You also have in the fat, you have in the muscle, brain, you have in the gut, where the incretin effect is reduced. And that is why incretin hormones, the GLPs work, and they'll come to that. And also in the kidney, where you can throw out the glucose from the kidney. Now, for each of these drugs, <clears throat> each of these sites, drugs are available. For example, for the beta cells, to improve the insulin secretion, you have the DPP-4 inhibitors, you have the low dose of sulfonyl ureas you can use, the GLP-1 receptor analogs, and so on. For the <clears throat> that is for the uh, for the beta cell. For the alpha cells, you have the incretin group of drugs, both the GLPs and the uh, DPP4s, which work. Liver classic drug is metformin. Metformin works on the liver and reduces the hepatic glucose production. It decreases insulin resistance. The brain, we do have drugs. The GLPs also work. Bromocryptin works. We don't use it much. Incretin drugs are very very important, and therefore in the intestine. We have the alpha glucose base inhibitors, DP4 inhibitors. We'll talk about that. We have the thiazolidine compounds, which work on the uh, uh, both in the muscle as well as in the adipose tissue. And of course, this big group of drugs which have come in the kidney called as the SGLT2 inhibitors. So you've got about seven or eight classes of drugs. It doesn't mean that every person with diabetes requires all these eight. This is where precision medicine comes in. This is where the clustering of diabetes comes in. And then you decide which patient needs which particular drug. But let me go from the beginning. Let me start with bigonides. Now, bigonides are not new drugs. They were actually first isolated in the 1920s. And then Roger Ranga introduced it in the 1950s. But from 1970s or 1960s, they've been available in India. In fact, it's very surprising, you may not believe this, that the United States did not want this drug to come. Why? Because it was a French drug. And they said, we don't want European products. So we don't want French drug. Finally, in 1992 or 93, 95, I think, 95, it went to uh, 95. So it was introduced in the US only in 1995. And it became a blockbuster. And ever since then, uh, bigonides remain the first line drug for treatment of uh, type 2 diabetes. And you won't believe it if I tell you that 50% of the entire metformin used in US comes from India. India is supplying the metformin to the US. And today it's the most widely prescribed anti-diabetic drug. It has stood the test of time. For almost 60 years, it has been 
around. Not only that, it's one of the most efficacious of all drugs. The HPNC reduction of the bigonides is matched only by the sulfonylureas, the two oldest drugs. All the new drugs cannot match it as far as uh, the efficacy is concerned. Also, it very rarely produces hypoglycemia. That's another big advantage. Of course, there are some minor side effects, diarrhea, abdominal discomfort, nausea, and so on. There is also some amount of vitamin B12 deficiency. So if you continuously take metformin, particularly in the vegetarians, you can get a little B12 deficiency. You might have to find either dietary source of B12 or even replace uh, B12. Things like lactic acidosis and so on, metformin-induced lactic acidosis. I think some two cases have been described in India in the last 50 years. And forget about it. I think for all practical purposes, it doesn't even exist. Now let's move on to sulfonylureas. Another class of drugs which has been around for many, many years. Now, I told you metformin works on insulin resistance, works on the liver. Sulfonylureas work on the pancreas. How does it work? This mechanism of action is shown here. <coughs> Excuse me. As the blood glucose level starts increasing, there is a group of transporters called as a GLUT2 transporter that shifts from inside the cell to the cell membrane. When that happens, what happens is the glucose gets attached to that and it is drawn inside and it is converted into ATP. This energy by the glucokinase enzyme, this ATP does one thing. The potassium channel is always uh, kept open. It will go and close that potassium channel. The moment it closes the potassium channel, this membrane here uh, gets depolarized. There's an the electrical change occurring. The moment the depolarization takes place, there's another channel called as a calcium channel. That calcium channel will open. That is kept closed. That will open now. When that opens, calcium will enter into the cell. This calcium will go and constrict the myosin, actin, myosin filaments there. And from there, the preformed insulin granules are secreted. And that is how you can see the insulin coming out now by a process of exocytosis. So this is the whole mechanism. We call this as the beta cell uh, mechanism right from the GLUT2 going there to the potassium channel closing, the calcium channel opening. And this is how the sulfonylurea works. Now, how does sulfonylurea actually work there? There are receptors which are located on that cell membrane, 65 kilo Dalton 1 and 105 kilo Dalton 1. So that is where the sulfonylurea goes and lodges itself. So in type 2 diabetes, all these are defective. The potassium channel is always kept open. Calcium channel doesn't uh, open. It is kept closed. The moment you give the sulfonylurea, this entire depolarization, so it can skip this pathway, and from there it will work. And that is how the sulfonylurea is able to increase the insulin secretion in type 2 diabetes. As I just mentioned, sulfonylureas and metformin, even though they're the oldest drugs, they're also the most powerful drugs. No other drug has been able to beat these two. And that is why they continue to be used even after 50, 60 years. The reduction in A1C is 1 to 2%. The only side effect of sulfonylurea is hypoglycemia because it's very powerful. Unlike metformin, it doesn't produce hypoglycemia. Uh, sulfonylurea can produce hypoglycemia if you don't watch out, especially if you're older, if you have renal inception, you will be careful. Weight gain also occurs. There are several generations of sulfonylurea. The old ones are all gone, tolbutamide and fluoropropamide. But today we have the modern sulfonylurea, of which uh, glimipride, I'll come to that, uh, uh, glimipride, and glycoside are called as a modern sulfonylureas. The glimipride is a long-acting drug, works about 24 hours, whereas glycoside is a little shorter acting. You have to give it BD dose usually. But of course, you have modified release ones which can be given once a day as well. So glycoside and glimipride have taken over as the most important sulfonylureas. They're called as the modern sulfonylureas. And they're still very popular. They're very cheap and they're still very effective. Very occasionally, you may get some Stephen Johnson's kind of syndrome that will be one in 50,000 people. It's not worth talking about very, very rare things. Now, uh, here are the, this is what I said, like hypersensitivity reaction. Hypoglycemia is something to be careful about as far as the sulfonylurea. So you start low and go slow. Start with a low dose and go slow when you increase. Next, I move on to the alpha glucose disinhibitors. Believe it or not, these drugs are used mostly in Asia mostly in India. Why? Because we have a very high carb load in our diet, which I already mentioned about. In the West, this drug, they've not even heard of alpha glucose disinhibitors. They're very, very useful to correct postprandial hyperglycemia. How does it work? 
There are three drugs, acarbose, miglitol, and voglibose, of which acarbose and voglibose are more popular. How do they work? Now, if you look at the intestinal uh, villi, now this is the villi, and in the villi, they have the brush border cells. And in this brush border cells, uh, you have an enzyme called as alpha glucosidase enzyme. This enzyme is responsible for the absorption of sucrose into the body. Starch that you eat, the rice, gets or wheat, gets broken down to sucrose, and then that gets absorbed. Or if you take sucrose itself, uh, glucose or sucrose, table sugar, it will get absorbed into the body. So you have this enzyme which is responsible for the absorption. Now, if you use a drug which blocks that enzyme, the alpha glucosidase enzyme, if you block it, then sucrose cannot get absorbed or your, or your starch cannot get absorbed, your carbohydrate cannot get absorbed. This will lead to blunting of the postprandial glucose levels. Very, very important in Indians whose blood sugars go very high after high carb meal, as shown here. If you don't take the alpha glucosidase inhibitor, most of the absorption occurs in the duodenum, a little bit in the jejunum. But if you add the alpha glucosidase inhibitor, it is blunted, which means that the absorption now takes place in the jejunum and in the ileum. Okay, or, or, the, or most of it occurs in the jejunum. Now this results this results in a flattening of the uh, uh, the, the postprandial glucose spikes. And that is why it's very popular in Asia, where a lot of carbohydrate is eaten. Now, these drugs are very nice. They have also been around for a long time, but they can lead to flatulence, bloating, and abdominal discomfort. That's the only side effect. Also, they're not very potent drugs. The potency is only 50% that of sulfonylurea or metformin. Now I go on to pioglitazone, which is the thiazolidine down compounds. Now, this particular group of drugs has had a very bad history siglitazone, englitazone, troglitazone, these are all drugs which came and got banned itself. Well, they have very highly toxic and uh, they produce liver failure, they led to liver transplants and so on, troglitazone. Then came rosiglitazone. Rosiglitazone was withdrawn because of the, it produces heart attacks, cardiac side effects. In fact, this entire CVOT trials for safety came only about uh, after rosiglitazone was withdrawn from the market around uh, 2005 or 2006. Then the only drug that we have now is pioglitazone. This also has a lot of side effects. I am not at all uh, in a big fan of this. And in fact, since I pushed for a ban on this, I became very unpopular with the, uh, uh, with the pharmaceutical industry. But I said this drug is also uh, toxic. Of course, it does have a lot of benefits. It's a very good anti-diabetic drug. It's also got some beneficial effect, I know, on uh, fatty liver and so on. So it does have its... Uh, it, its effects and its benefits. But the problem is it has a lot of uh, side effects. And these side effects uh, are uh, weight gain, massive weight gain, fluid overload, fractures in women. And there is a hepatotoxicity, uh, not that much with the pyoglitazone. Macular edema occurs in patients. And there is also a risk of bladder cancer. This is the controversy because I, I reported a few cases of bladder cancer with pyoglitazone which the industry came down on me very, very heavily. Uh, but I still continue to see a few cases of bladder cancer. I'm keeping quiet now because I've been hit by industry enough. Uh, so, but it does occur. It's, it's rare. It is also dose related. It's also related to how many, how long you take it. But by and large, pyoglitazone has lost its sheen. Very, very few people use it. All over the world, only 2% of people, of physicians use pyoglitazone now. Incretin mimetics are the new kids on the block, and these have really taken the world by storm. Now, there are two types of uh, incretins. Uh, the, first of all, these are based on the uh, intestinal hormones, GLP-1, gluconic peptide 1, and GIP. And there are some which are now inhibitors of both, or analogs of both, the GLP as well as uh, GIP. New drugs are coming. Now, the advantage of these drugs is that, see, till now we talked only about the beta cell. We didn't talk about the alpha cell. These drugs have an effect on both the alpha cell as well as the beta cell. So from the alpha, from the beta cells, they produce insulin. And in the alpha cell, they suppress glucagon. Glucagon, you know, is the exact opposite of insulin. So whenever the sugar goes up, uh, insulin will come out. Whenever the sugar goes down, glucagon will come out. 
So these drugs work on both. So this hyperglucagonemia, which we see, the alpha cell is hyperreactive in diabetes, that is suppressed by this group of drugs, which no other group of drugs do. Now, since the GLP and GIP are the main ones which are working, you may say, why not just give the GLP alone? Why don't you just give the GLP itself? GLP has a very short half-life. So you cannot actually just infuse it as a GLP or take it as a oral route and so on. So you'll have to give something which mimics it or makes it work better. These are called as a GLP-1 receptor agonists. Okay? There are a number of them. Exonatide was the first to come. Liraglutide was the next. Uh, the one which became very popular in India is liraglutide, or otherwise called as Victosa. Lixinatide is also there. Dulaglutide is very interesting because it's once a week. Just take it once a week and you get weight loss. You get uh, good reduction in HbA1c and so on. Side effects are very rare, although it's mentioned pancreatitis, cancer and all that, extremely rare. And therefore, this thyroid cell carcinoma keeps on coming. There's no human report so far of thyroid cell. Only in some mice, they've seen all this. They're very safe. The only side effect that you have is nausea. If you increase the dose very rapidly, they develop nausea. They are very expensive. Now, semaglutide is going to be a game changer. The, uh, the weekly semaglutide has become one of the most popular drugs ever in the history of medicine. This drug called as Vigovi uh, or Ozembic in the United States last year, 30 to 40 billion dollars was the uh, sales of this one particular drug. No statin, no other drug has made such waves. And now it's going to come to India. But the oral one has already come to India. Oral one is called ribelsis. And that has come to India. Why is it so popular? First of all, it's only once a week injection. Second, the oral, of course, you take every day, produces profound weight loss. The weight loss with semaglutide and some of these drugs is equated to bariatric surgery. So if you can lose 30 kilos with bariatric surgery, you can lose 20, 30 kilos with this drug also. And it's only a once a week injection. Okay. So these drugs are very, very popular. They're also quite profound uh, uh, blood sugar lowering agents and they also protect the heart. So they are very good. So the other way to approach this instead of using the GLP-1 receptor analogs is to use an enzyme. Uh, the DPP-4 enzyme is what degrades the GLP down into inactive GLP and GIP. So if you can use an inhibitor to block that, and these are all the inhibitors which are used, citagliptin, pildagliptin, saxagliptin, these are the uh, linagliptin, tenligliptin, and gemigliptin, of which uh, the most popular are cita, wilda, and lina. Okay, So these drugs are oral. They can be used. They're much cheaper. And now many of them have gone off patent. Sita, Wilda have gone off patent. Tenilagliptin anyway was a very cheap drug. And we were the first to show that these drugs actually have a better response in Indians. This was the first paper in 2009 where we looked at the, the uh, efficacy of citagliptin in China, India, and Korea. And I happen to be the first author of this paper where we showed that the HbA1c reduction Normally with DPP-4 inhibitors, they're considered very mild drugs. You get about 0.6, 0.7% HbA1c reduction in the Chinese, in the white population. In Indians and in Koreans, we found 1.36% reduction in A1c, which is never reported from any other country. First, we thought it's just a, you know, by chance thing. Later on, we found that there's a true effect of the DPP-4 inhibitors. And it's been repeatedly shown by different studies from India and Korea that some of the Indians and the Koreans probably because we have a beta cell deficiency, which is more, they seem to respond very well. Now they, they are one of the safest of all the drugs. They virtually have no side effects. Very, very rarely some cold-like symptoms or some skin reactions and so on, or very, very, very rarely some acute pancreatitis. I think from India, one or two cases of pancreatitis have been reported in the last 10 years or 15 years. It's virtually uh, it's a little bit of increase in amylase or lipase may occur, but virtually it is one of the safest of all. In fact, this drug is so safe, you can use it in a 100-year-old person also. Nothing will happen. No hypoglycemia will occur. Virtually no side effects occur. SGLT2 drugs are the next kids on the block, and they work in a completely different way. What happens is they work on the kidney, and in the kidney, we know that the glucose goes in, and then the glucose is reabsorbed back into the blood. If you use an SGLT2 inhibitor, 
it will block that re in the, this reabsorption of glucose. So what happens is that all the glucose gets pushed out through the urine. So you'll find a lot of glucose coming in the urine. If you measure your urinary glucose, you'll find it's going up very, very high. And because of that, you get reduction in sugar, reduction in weight, and many, many benefits. In fact, the SGLT2 drugs have become the most popular of all the anti-diabetic drugs because they have many other benefits, weight reduction, BP reduction, sugar reduction, protects the kidney, protects the heart. It's supposed to be good even for NAFLD. So the SGLT2 drugs are one of the most prescribed drugs today. Okay, the HPNC reduction is about 0.7 to 1%, virtually no hypoglycemia. The only side effect of these drugs are that they produce genital itching as well as urinary infection because a lot of glucose is going in the urine. So therefore, both in men and women, you can get genital urinary, especially genital infection. So that's the only side effect. Weight loss is good with these agents, not like the GLP-1 receptor and not like semaglutide and so on, but you can get about 2-3 kg weight loss. They're quite safe. You should be a little careful because BP drops a little bit. In very old people, you must be careful. But the big news about this drug is that when they did the CVOT trials, which I mentioned after rosiglitazone uh, FDA mandated, they found that with the SGLT2 drugs, there was reduction in heart failure, reduction in atherosclerotic heart disease, coronary artery disease. And therefore, today, the cardiologists claim that this is not a diabetic drug, it is their drug. They're using it in people without diabetes. Nephrologists claim that it's their drug. They are using it in people without even kidney, without diabetes, they're using it uh, for uh, treating kidney disease. So these drugs have really become runaway success. Very occasionally, euglycemic ketosis can come. More, more importantly, this gentle mycotic infection is something which uh, happens. Now, we did a study in 2020 where we compared Asians as well as uh, white people and looked at, because remember I told you that the DPP4 inhibitors, we already reported that it works better in Asians. Here we looked at both SGLT2, all the studies published in the world. We did a meta-analysis and a systematic review. One of our PhD students, uh, Shushima Gan, worked on this. What we found was uh, 14 Asian studies and 19 white studies. Look at the uh, reduction in A1C in the DPP4, uh, with the DPP4 inhibitors, much more in the Asians than in the white. You may say, but you reported 1.3 and here only 0.7. This is because the Chinese are included in this. All Asians are included. So Chinese have much lower response. If you remove the Chinese, it becomes almost 1.2, 1.3 in the Indians and the Koreans. But even here, it is statistically significant, even if you include the Chinese. So somehow it seems to work better in the Asians. If we just look at this, see if you look at the reduction here, look at where the Asians are. They're all here. And these are all the white people. So you can clearly see that the Asians are responding better. The, all the studies done in the world are, are, are put uh, here. Okay. Now, if you look at SGLT2, this is a new finding from this particular study, which made a lot of news. The SGLT2s also seem to work better in the Asians than in the white population. Look at the white population. They're all here on this side of the line. Look at the Asians. They're all here. So this is the first time the world literature where we showed that the Asians respond better to the SGLT2 drugs uh, as well. So this was the conclusion of the study that both in uh, as far as DPP4 as well as SGLT2 as uh, are concerned, the Asians seem to respond better, which is good for us. So we can use these drugs. Now, the last four or five slides, I'm going to summarize. I told you about so many drugs. I told you about metformin, I told you about sulfonylurea, told you about alpha glucose disinhibitor, I told you about GLP-1 receptor analog, I told you about thiazoldine down, I told you about GLP-1 receptor analog, DPP-4 inhibitor, and SGLT2. Eight groups of drugs I've told about. Now, how do you put this all together as a physician? Now, there are many things that you can look. What are you looking for? Are you looking for the most efficacious drug? Use metformin and sulfonylurea. You'll get the best. Are you looking for hypoglycemia? Avoid sulfonylurea. Use DPP-4 inhibitor or metformin or something. Are you afraid about weight gain? Then use SGLT2 or GLP1. I'll show you that in a minute. Okay. And are you worried about side effects? Then, if you're worried about some side effects, avoid those drugs which produce that. Of course, age, affordability also make a difference. For example, GLP1, I told you they're very good for weight loss. How many people can afford GLP1 receptor analogs today? They're very, very expensive. They cost at least 10 to 12,000 rupees a month. How many people can afford that? One drug costs 10,000 rupees. So, very few can afford it. Okay, 
Now, this is the in terms of HP and C reduction. I told you top of the list is the sulfonylurea and metformin. All others are lower. Maybe the DPP4 inhibitors can match them in India uh, as being better. And SGLT2 is also in Indians, they work a little better. But all others are less. The only one which can work unlimited is insulin. And I'm not talking about insulin today at all. I'm talking only about the oral anti diabetic drugs. Risk of hypoglycemia is a serious one. It can kill people if you're 60, 70, 80 years old, if you're frail, if you have comorbidities, you have heart disease, you have stroke. You must be very careful in using certain drugs. Uh, so the drugs that you can use are metformin, BPP4 inhibitors, maybe to some extent SGL T2 drugs, but insulin, sulfonylureas, you must be very careful about. Now, as far as weight is concerned, I already mentioned that for weight loss, the best one is the GLP-1 receptor analog. Next one is the SGLT2 drugs. Uh, or most of the others are kind of weight neutral. But if you use insulin, if you use pioglitazone, or if you use sulfonylurea, your weight will go up. They, are, they definitely increase your weight. So if you don't want weight to go up, you should avoid certain drugs. Okay. Now we come to renal failure. If you have renal failure, uh, can you use anti -diabetic, oral anti-diabetic drugs? Well, I'll tell you a simple thing. If you have severe renal failure, okay, your EGFR is less than 30 or less than 15, avoid all oral anti-diabetic drugs. Use only insulin. The only exception could be lenagliptin. Lenagliptin can be used in any stage of renal failure, in any stage of hepatic uh, failure as well. So lenagliptin is the only drug which can be used even without dose reduction. Same 5 milligrams can be used throughout. Every other drug, even metformin, you have to be careful below 30. EGFR, Carbos, you should not use. Uh, sulfonylurea, better not to use. Thiazoldine dions, definitely you should not use. And even DPP for other DPP4 inhibitors and so on, better even GLP1 receptor analogs. If you have got severe renal insufficiency, I would say use only insulin. That is the safest. Okay. This is from the American Diabetic Association and the EASD uh, guidelines. Okay. I told you five years ago, they had only one thing try diet. That doesn't work, give metformin. If metformin doesn't work, they had all these six. You choose any, anything for anybody. That's how they said. There was no personalization at all. There's no precision diabetes at all. Today, it has changed. The last three, four years, it has changed. First thing that they're asking is, okay, metformin is good, but even metformin need not be the first line drug. It may be SGLT2, it may be something else. Now, if there is a high risk of atherosclerotic heart disease or kidney disease or heart failure, okay, First drug of choice, if you have heart failure, will be the SGLT2 drugs. Okay, they are the drug of choice. If atherosclerotic heart disease is your problem, either you use the GLP-1 receptor analog or SGLT2 drugs. So as far as heart is concerned, if you have a heart problem or you're a high-risk heart patient, use SGLT2 drugs. You can also use uh, GLP-1 receptor analog. Now, if your main worry is hypoglycemia, avoid sulfonylureas, Use DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1, SGLT2s, and maybe pyoglitzone. Now, if your main thing is to lose weight, GLP-1 will come right on top. If that's your priority, you want to lose 10, 20 kilos, nothing can beat GLP-1 receptor and block. It's expensive, but what to do? We hope the cost comes down. SGLT2s, good. You may not lose that much weight like GLP-1, but you can still use it. And lastly, if cost is the factor, you have got a poor patient who cannot afford any of this. Good old sulfonylurea and metformin is good enough in the majority of cases. Of course, thiazoldine dions can also be used. As I told you, I don't use it much. Therefore, to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes is multifactorial. It's not just one defect, but about eight defects built into one. We don't have to use eight drugs, but use more than one drug. If you use just one metformin or one sulfonylurea or one DP before, you may not uh, achieve it. You can mix and match based on the pathophysiology, based on your patient, based on the need, based on the weight, based on the age, based on comorbidities, you now have a choice. So this is precision medicine at its best. So we have different, different oral drugs. Metformin continues to rule the roost. It gets the safest drug. You can still continue to use it. What you use second, third, and fourth, there are a number of indications for you to decide. But never forget the patient. Always discuss the options with the patient. Tell the patient about the cost also. Sometimes you just tell the cost, they'll say, I don't want it. Okay. Sometimes you tell them it may produce gentle infection. No, 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 I don't want it. 
I don't want I don't want dental infection and all that. So there are people who are very sensitive. Tell them about the possible side effects, and then you help to choose the drug between you and the patient. You can discuss and then choose your drug. So with that, I will stop, and then if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. This is excellent. It was a revision and new learning for, I'm sure, everybody who listened to you. Simplified approach to diabetes. I would like to encourage comments from everyone. I have just one question and uh, yes. the experience that we have. We have patients of diabetes and liver disease like cirrhosis. I just reviewed about a year ago and I'll be as we are 2900 diabetics with cirrhosis. Okay. The first drug of choice remains metformin and linagliptin, as you said. Yes. There are two advantages that we found. Uh, one was it uh, deactivates stillate cell and therefore there is a reduction in fibrosis and portal pressure. And if three years of metformin, in fact, the liver pressures from 18 have come down to 12 or 13. So it is a regression of liver disease and portal pressure. Our challenge remains that these patients lose a kilogram or two, but they don't lose more weight and they remain... And obese. appetite also is a little bit of a problem. And uh, Yeah, so this is the only challenge. And my question to you, if you have a diabetic with cirrhosis or a cirrhotic with diabetes, what is your first choice of agent? Insulin. Insulin will be my first choice. Of course, linagliptin, I can still continue. Uh, once uh, obvious cirrhosis sets in, whether metformin can still be continued, uh, I'm not sure. I suppose low dose can still be continued. Linagliptin at any stage, they say it's okay. No dose reduction also, 100% safe. So linagliptin will be the only drug. I would hesitate to use thiazolidinedions or, uh, or sulfonylureas, AGI, they cannot tolerate already bloating and, and everything. So virtually every other drug is low. SGLT2 again will be a problem. There'll be fluid overload. There'll be all kinds of problems. So I, I think that uh, insulin will be my first choice, no doubt. Just to say, we use metformin. There was a paper. Can yeah. QC? There was a paper. Can ah. QC in hepatology ah. where he said that metformin plus gliptin, gliptins ah. can be used. Okay. But uh, I need your experience. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'll hand over. I'll keep the us. metformin thing in in view. Of course, we don't stop metformin for uh, renal, but uh, I look at the evidence, and now that you say that, we'll continue to use uh, metformin as well. So. Okay. And there are many questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, one of maybe you can read them. I'll, I'll just go through them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Good evening. Do you have genetic variations type two diabetes complications? Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, so. If you look at the complications, uh, the uh, as far as the SID variety is concerned, the severe insulin deficient variety, they are more prone. First of all, they have their own genetic uh, connections. And then they are more prone to retinopathy and neuropathy, but not to kidney disease, liver disease, or heart disease. The insulin resistant ones, they are more prone to NAFL, to liver disease, to uh, nephropathy, kidney disease, as well as to cardiovascular disease. And the SID, the third variety, which has combined insulin deficiency and uh, resistance, not surprisingly, they're prone to both kidney as well as to, uh, to eye complication. These have been very well described in the literature and our own findings also support that. So this helps because if you cluster your patients, you can predict which complication uh, develops. And of course, the pharmacogenomics of that also uh, varies. Different people respond better to uh, different drugs. Now, is there salivary glucose and it's interesting that you use it when just coming from... I just wanted to uh, add, uh, Dr. Yeah. Mohan. Yes. Uh, excellent uh, lecture and I think it was a beautiful presentation. I'm a surgeon and I Thank think you. I got all those things exposed again. Uh, I hope you are aware about Project Zhao. Are you aware of Project Zhao, which is uh, a persistent, uh, say, leadership uh, collaboration between, for using digital media? Oh. For control of diabetes. Oh, right. right. In case not, then I would appreciate uh, to interact with Dr. Agarwal, Sanjay okay. Agarwal from. Okay. Just send Anna. me his. Uh, and then I think email uh, ID what, and I will, what is required uh, is uh, uh, all those uh, EMR and all those digital media reports of no. diabetes has to be uh, translated in terms of better uh, management of India. So I will connect okay. with you. Okay, definitely. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you, sir.
So the next question is from Dr. Jayachandran about salivary glucose. It's interesting you mentioned that it was just yesterday I was at the Indian Institute of Science. I'm on the governing council now. And I was interacting with a scientist who's actually measuring the salivary glucose. Now, it is possible that we can develop that. In fact, they developed a kit for it at the Indian Institute of Science. But the problem is the concentration of glucose in the saliva is very low. It is something like uh, 0.8 or uh, 1 milligram or something as compared to 80 milligrams, 100 milligrams in the, in the, in the blood. And the, but the correlation is still good. If you, if you are still able to uh, you know, draw the correlation, uh, it is quite good. It's not very good in people without diabetes because then the range becomes very narrow. Uh, they have all the non-diabetic will have between 70, 80, 90. There too, for saliva to pick it up become difficult. But in those who have severe diabetes, where the spread is more, even saliva is uh, is coming out. So we are trying to develop a kit for that. It's a very, very nice question. I hope uh, come, something comes out. Can alpha glucose days be used for weight control? Not really, because they help to reduce the postprandial glucose. They are weight neutral. Metformin, little bit weight reduction, but alpha glucose days uh, is weight neutral. Diabetes, drug interaction, geriatric population, is there any drug interaction? Well, you have to, each drug has its own interaction. So you will have to look at it because we don't know what all they're taking. They may be taking an antihypertensive drug, they may be taking something for uh, uh, statin, they may be taking something else they'll be taking. So you'll have to overall see. But in general, the anti-diabetic drugs generally can be taken as part of polypharmacy. Uh, nothing happens in general, but there could be exceptions. and. There could be individual variations also as far as patients are concerned. What is the status of tirsapatide? Yeah, so I mentioned in, in passing that the GLP-1 as well as GIP, both uh, uh, agonists of that is tirsapatide. Fantastic drug. Eli Lilly is bringing. It's going to be a close competitor for uh, semaglutide. The amount of weight loss that you get with tirsapatide is some 30 kilos or something like that. Unbelievable weight loss with tirsapatide. Um, so it's going to be, again, very expensive. But uh, for those who really want that kind, we don't want bariatric surgery. And if you want, uh, you know, a drug, both uh, uh, the uh, uh, the parenteral semaglutide and tirsapatide are showing great promise uh, to replace uh, bariatric surgery. Uh, do we know diabetes immunosuppressant person who's diabetic 15 years develop malignancy? So the uh, the 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 the, core, the uh, overlap between diabetes and malignancy is increasing. So we are seeing a lot of liver malignancy, uh, which Dr. Sarin already mentioned. After the stage of cirrhosis, next is hepatocellular carcinoma. And we know that NAFLD itself is so much commoner in those with diabetes. So clearly liver cancer comes out, pancreas cancer comes out, so pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Then there are uh, certain other uh, lymphomas and a few other things which are more common. One, uh, breast, breast is one of the commonest uh, thing. Uh, cervix, uterus, uh, you know, uh, cancers uh, are, are also more common in, in diabetes. Breast is one of the commonest which has been uh, studied. Uh, so the AMPK pathways and uh, there are a lot of overlap between diabetes, metabolism and cancer. So I've always suggested that uh, every month, at least one new case of cancer I pick up at our center by routine ultrasound or by doing routine screening. So we should never lose the opportunity. These are all people who are 50, 60 years old who may just walk in with diabetes and they'll have a kidney tumor or liver tumor or some other tumor. So we shouldn't miss uh, those. Even a simple hematology parameter will help to pick up some leukemias and, and many yeah. other things. So uh, cancer and diabetes overlap is becoming more and more uh, common. Dr. Sarin, you wanted to add something about yeah, that? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that there is very close relation between diabetologists and hepatologists. Yes. And also that there is a time run and I think uh, Preeti would like to invite Dr. Professor Sunita Mittal for next sure. session. And we all would like to give a, and a big round of applause. We are very grateful and thank, thank you, Dr. Mohan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Preeti.
Good evening, everyone. Is somebody starting this session or I go ahead? Uh, please go ahead, uh, Dr. Mittal. Okay. I've been just given Dr. Picky's CV, so maybe you can put that on the screen. And while that is coming on the screen at the outset, I would like to compliment Professor Shiv Sareen, President Nams, and Professor Kapil, already Secretary Nams, for starting this innovative method of teaching. It's really wonderful and it is really needed in our country when we have such diverse levels of education in different universities and horizontal expansion of correct knowledge is an absolute must. Me, me, me. Yeah, I'm really can. curious to know how many postgraduates are attending it. Because I, this is one media by which you can actually reach even up to 5,000 people. But if I see the number of participants on screen, it is just 24, which mainly includes the faculty. So is there another link for delegates where the delegates have logged in or what is it? That is one thing. Of course, introducing Piki is a real pleasure. Uh, I have seen her. Since her school days, she, here is a big biodata put here. If you see, she has a very, very, very glorious data with 32 gold medals, publications, books, consultancies, reviews, and all. In fact, I have seen her grow. Uh, many of you would know her. She is daughter of our Ames campus and daughter-in-law of our campus. And from that childhood, she has grown up to this glorious position. And she and diabetes is something I think Nams has managed to get the best speaker because she has been conducting courses on diabetes in pregnancy now for several years on the platform of Lady Harding Medical College we are currently as a director professor at LHMC. And I'm sure you all can read that she's editor, she's reviewer, she's been... Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you yes. there. She, yes. ma Dr. Sunita Mittal is my mentor and teacher. And I'm really honored today to hear the talk of Dr. Uh, Mohan. It was an excellent, uh, such an exhaustive talk giving brief about everything. And I'm honored the Dr. Sareen and Dr. Kapish, uh, Kapil Mesh uh, to uh, meet you here. And uh, I'm uh, very happy that I have been invited to such a glorious forum. And uh, thank you, ma'am, for such an elaborate uh, uh, introduction. And I'll go ahead with my talk now. Please go ahead. Gee. Thank you, ma'am. So I will uh, be talking on approach to a pregnant woman with diabetes mellitus. Why are we having so much of discussion, so many conferences, webinars and CMEs about diabetes? When I was doing my post-graduation, there were hardly any women who were suffering from GDM and diabetes. But at now, at, uh, now we are getting so many patients who are having not just gestational diabetes, but also type 2 diabetes mellitus. Hyperglycemia in pregnancy is a major global health problem. It is one of the most common medical disorders uh, during pregnancy. And one out of six live births occur to a woman with some sort of hyperglycemia. 84% of these are due to GDM. So we know that hyperglycemia in pregnancy is associated with increased maternal and perinatal morbidity and mortality. And it has long-term consequences for both the mother and the child. The slides are not moving. Okay. So uh, we know that uh, why uh, so much of perinatal complications, pregnancy complications are present in a woman with hyperglycemia. During early pregnancy, these women are more prone to get abortions. They are more associated with hypertensive diseases of pregnancy, 
which could be chronic hypertension, gestational hypertension, or preeclampsia. Many of them develop a macrosomia, hydramnios, several recurrent UTIs, and vaginal infections. Uh, many of them have a preterm delivery because of repeated infections and because of polyhydramnios. During delivery, the baby is big, so the baby is stuck. There is prolonged labor, obstructed labor. There is a lot of instrumental delivery. There is shoulder dystocia, which causes injury to the mother's perineum. And uh, permanent problems can occur to the anal sphincter, to the urinary incontinence can occur. and uh, after delivery, there are more chances of postpartum hemorrhage. These women are more prone to thromboembolism. They are having failed lactation. They are not able to feed their babies and they are more prone to purpural sepsis. Infections are very, very common in these women. And after pregnancy, they are not able to lose weight. So there is a problem of weight retention. Two thirds of these women are going to develop GDM in the next subsequent pregnancy. And 50 to 70% are going to develop type 2 diabetes as they become older. For the baby, again, there is risk of abortions. In, in cases of pre-gestational diabetes, there are chances of so many congenital anomalies, cardiac anomaly, neural anomaly, all sorts of anomalies. Then there are sudden stillbirths. Everything is going fine. But suddenly we have stillbirths. Mortality is very, very high. Neonatal complications, metabolic complications like respiratory distress syndrome, hypoglycemia, hypothermia, hypocalcemia, polycythemia, neonatal hyperbilirubinemia, and the baby get, is prone to get so many injuries during delivery when it is a instrumental delivery or when the baby has a shoulder dystocia. This is not the end of it. As the child grows up, there has been intrauterine programming, and this child is susceptible to get childhood uh, obesity, impaired glucose tolerance, impaired uh, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular diseases. So let us come to the nomenclature. We hear so many terms and I am in Lady Harding Medical College where even the faculty is confused. What is hyperglycemia in pregnancy? What is diabetes in pregnancy? What is overt diabetes, progestational, pre-gestational diabetes? What is type 1, type 2? And how do you differentiate? So here I would like to uh, take a minute in explaining the terminologies. These are the new terminology. All the types of hyperglycemia in pregnancy can be uh, grouped into two. Diabetes in pregnancy. This is the same as pre-gestational diabetes or overt diabetes. And uh, it is now known as diabetes in pregnancy. This could be type 1 or type 2. So the threshold of diagnosing diabetes in pregnant women is the same as in non-pregnant patients, both males and females. So if the fasting any time is more than 126, more than or equal to 126, she may be uh, antenatal, she may be in the, in the labor room, she may be postnatal, or she may be non-pregnant. If any time the threshold of fasting is more than 126 or random or two hour post-glucose is more than 200, straight away we label her as overt diabetes or diabetes in pregnancy, which is now the new terminology. And when the, uh, when the glucose threshold is between 140 to 199, she is termed as gestational diabetes. So diabetes in pregnancy, we very well know, it could be diagnosed before the start of pregnancy or any time most of the women are being tested for glucose, uh, blood sugar test during pregnancy. So at any time, if these are the thresholds, we can straight away label them as diabetes in pregnancy or gestational hyper uh, diabetes. So coming to the pathophysiology, this is a very, very important slide. And this explains why the perinatal complications are there. So in a mother who is hyperglycemic, we are mostly talking about glucose, but it is not just the glucose, but also includes lipids and amino acids, all the fuels which are high in high amount in the mother pass through the placenta and go to the fetus. Because of this, the fetus of uh, the pancreas, the beta cells of the pancreas start secreting more of insulin and there is fetal hyperinsulinemia. As insulin is an anabolic uh, 
uh, hormone so there is macrosomia as all the organs are big so it leads to increased tissue consumption leading to chronic hypoxia and altered oxygen delivery because of this two things occur because of hypoxia there is increased erythropoietin formation which as the baby uh, develops uh, develops polycythemia and hyperbilirubinemia the other thing is that these children are already having chronic hypoxia and the placenta is also having villus edema it is not uh, the vasculopathy is there so when the woman goes into labor the blood supply to the baby is further compromised and as the period of gestation increases there is aging of the placenta and we have sudden stillbirths and perinatal asphyxia these children are more prone to get myocardiopathies and because of decreased formation of lung surfactants as the baby is born they have respiratory distress syndrome so we have about 11 guidelines uh, across the world to uh, define how uh, what, uh, to but there is no consensus regarding the best approach for screening and diagnosing women with gdm indian women have 11 times higher risk of developing gdm so there is no question it is an understood thing and the national guidelines advocate that all pregnant women should have a universal testing during their first visit as we have ethnic propensity so in a hyperglycemic mother each islet cell functions as an endocrine organs most of the organogenesis is completed by the time the lady comes to know that she is pregnant by 8 weeks but these pancreas are developing at 10 to 11 weeks of gestation so as i said earlier maternal hyperglycemia at this time leads to beta cell hyperplasia hyperinsulinemia macrosomia and after uh, birth of the baby early uh, the, these children are more prone to develop type 2 diabetes there is early maternal metabolic imprinting which occurs in the first trimester if uh, itself and therefore early screening in our test books there used to be the uh, teaching that we should test all women for diabetes at 24 to 26 weeks this could be because the placenta is mature at that time and maximum amount of glucogenic hormones are being produced but now uh, with the new uh, latest development the barker hypothesis we are sure that whenever the woman presents to us 6 weeks 8 weeks we need to test her with Uh, for uh, diabetes in pregnancy so how to screen which diagnostic criteria to be used it is so difficult to remember all the values one step test two step test 50 g 75 g 100 g glucose load how many samples should be taken and what are the threshold so in a nutshell these are the important guidelines the acog guidelines i am not going to elaborate all of them acog guidelines we uh, know that the ndg criteria in 1979 and carpenter question in 1982 uh, were uh, given and they have a two step screening in the first visit they give 50 g glucose and they do a gct women who are found positive in that undergo this test and in this fasting 1 hour 2 hour 3 hour so five blood samples are drawn the woman has to come in a fasting state second uh, visit has to be done then came the who 1999 criteria which is the same as non pregnant women and our dipsy guidelines were formed in 2004 and the national guidelines the mohfw guidelines have been uh, reinforcing the dipsy criteria that was laid down uh, the mohfw guidelines came out in uh, 2018 and they again uh, emphasized that the only doable test the test which can be done in fasting state non fasting state irrespective of meals is the dipsy test and this is what is advocated and if you will appreciate here the who 1999 the dipsy test iadpsd uh, and the nice guidelines all advocate 140 m, uh, mg as the threshold at 2 hours so the iadpsg criteria which is the only criteria till now which is based on fetal maternal outcome uh, is has been accepted by ada and who in 2013 and in this the woman has to come in a fasting state a fasting glucose level is done if it is more than 92 uh, 
then the lady can be uh, labeled as GDM. She is given a 75 gram glucose load and testing is again done at one hour and two hour. And these are the threshold, 180 at one hour and at two hours, it is 153. So this is based on the HAPO study, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which included 23,000 women across 15 centers in nine countries over six years. So here they correlated that there was a continuous positive correlation between maternal plasma glucose levels with the adverse fetal outcomes like birth weight more than 90th percentile, uh, cord C peptide level more than 90th percentile and cesarean section and neonatal hyperglycemia. But please note that adverse maternal and fetal outcomes were observed at levels even below this diagnostic cutoff. So DIPSI test, the Indian guidelines 2018 again reinforce the DIPSI test should be done at the first visit. If she's found negative, it should be repeated at 24 to 28 weeks. And there should be a gap of four hours. If the woman uh, vomits within 30 minutes, it has to be done on a later date. If it is, uh, if the vomiting occurs after 30 minutes, then it need not be repeated again. So uh, a 75 gram glucose is given in one glass of water, which the lady has to drink in five to 10 minutes. The, after two hours, if the venous plasma glucose is more than 150, the government of India says that plasma calibrated glucometer can also be used to give the report at this time. So uh, if the 75, the real challenge is in most of the places we get that glucon C, glucon D pack, which is 100 grams. So what we can do is tea le uh, five level teaspoonful can be removed from it and then the lady can take it. So we did this study in Lady Harding and we found that the diagnostic accuracy of non-fasting DIPSI was nearly 98% as compared to the uh, WHO OGTT. And there was a very good agreement between the two tests. And at that time, the prevalence in Lady Harding was 6.25%. This is a uh, recent publication where the uh, incidence, the prevalence of diabetes has increased to 10.4%. Uh, very recently, it has increased to 30% in our hospital. So in this paper, we again confirmed the, uh, compared the diagnostic accuracy of DIPSI with carpenter Kusan and NDDG, and we found a very good sensitivity and specificity. So what are the target plasma glucose levels? According to all these guidelines, the fasting should be less than 95. And the 2R, we are generally not measuring the 1R post-meal values. The 2R post-meal should be less than 120. HbA1c, if you are doing HbA1c, it should be less than 6%. Uh, if it's a type 2 diabetes patient, we can relax it to 6.5%. And during labor, it is advocated that it, the levels should be between 70 to 120. If the target plasma glucose are exceeding these, we tell them to do the lifestyle changes in the form of medical nutrition therapy and exercise. Our uh, physician friends are very, very uh, used to doing HbA1c, but the efficacy of WHO does not recommend HbA1c to be done during pregnancy. Because of the increased uh, prevalence of anemia in our women, the RBC turnover rate is very high. The accreditation of the labs which are doing this, which HPLC technique, which is advocated, is very low. It is an expensive test and it gives a control over three uh, months. In pregnancy, we want to control day to day, both uh, uh, by postprandial values. So this is not a very good tool, but it is. it gives a good information in the first trimester. And if it is found to be more than 6%, then we can say that the or it comes high. It, uh, it has been seen that as the level of HbA1c increases during the first trimester, uh, the rate of congenital anomalies also increases. And above 10%, the risk of congenital anomalies in the baby is nearly 25%. So ideally, if a woman is having type 2 or type 1 diabetes, she should be having a very good preconceptional counseling, which is the most important thing. We need to educate her about the risk, the diet, exercise, SMBG, self-monitoring of plasma glucose, signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. She should be put on folic acid, four milligram per day, uh, three months before she conceives. We need to treat her hypertension aggressively 
and it should be brought down below 130 to one uh, to uh, by 80 we need to change the oral hypoglycemics other than metformin all other uh, anti-diabetic uh, drugs, oral anti-diabetic drugs should not be given. ACE inhibitor, ARB, statins should be stopped. We need to do a retinal assessment, renal assessment, thyroid testing, test for neuropathy, do a foot examination and tell her to use an effective contraception till her weight and HbA1c is optimized. In case the woman is coming to us and we find that she's having uh, type 2 diabetes, over diabetes, or even GDM. We need to uh, do a complete workup for her. We order a CBC, LFT, KFT, urine protein and creatinine ratio, and uh, ECG, fundus examination, all should be done. And uh, in case anything is found to be amiss, then we need to refer her to the uh, uh, physician or endocrinologist or our medical specialist. And uh, in each visit, otherwise the government of India says low risk pregnancy, four visit. In these women, we need to have four extra visit, nearly eight visits or maybe more. And in each visit, we need to see the weight gain, blood pressure, blood sugar, urine albumin and ketones. So what is medical nutrition therapy? I think Dr. Serene gave an excellent example. In a very busy OPD, I use the same. This is the government of India, Thali. Half of the plate is full of uh, uncooked or cooked vegetables, one fourth is protein and one fourth is uh, carbohydrates. And uh, along with this, one serving of uh, fruit and verse, one serving of some dairy product like chaach or something. So it is very difficult for our patients to understand kitna, uh, what amount of carbohydrate, 40%, 50%, all that. So this is a very good method which can be used. And the aim is to give optimal nutrition to the mother and the developing baby. Too much of weight gain should not be done, but we have to optimize weight gain depending on the pre-pregnancy or first trimester BMI. Carbohydrate quantity, quality and distribution across the day has to be done. Three major meals, three minor meals, so that we don't have too much of glycemic variability. Uh, there are uh, not too much high and low levels. It should be moderate level all throughout. And not just glucose, we need to give her an adequate amount of protein, fat and micronutrient. Exercise, a word about exercise, which is very, very important, as Sir has already uh, told us. Moderate exercise uh, program is advocated. At least 30 minutes of moderate intensity uh, aerobic exercises or walk is uh, very good. At least five times a week, 150 minutes uh, uh, per week. Uh, five days a week and or 150 minutes per week and they can do any exercise they, that they like yoga zumba swimming uh, if they are already doing exercise uh, or gym or cycling before they become pregnant they can continue the same uh, and also measure glucose levels before and after exercise and hydrate themselves well. They should not wear heels. They should not wear synthetic clothes. And simple exercises, if they can't do at least 10 to 15 minutes of walk after each uh, meal. And they can do limb exercises, breathing exercises. So we can give a trial of two weeks in the second trimester or one week in the third trimester of medical nutrition therapy. But still, if the targets are not complied, then we need to turn to pharmacotherapy and the gold standard always is insulin if the woman is not willing to take she stays far away she is not able to monitor she is uh, uh, uneducated not able to do self monitoring of blood glucose and uh, we need to attain normoglycemia somehow then uh, metformin can also be prescribed these are some of the indications for initiating insulin therapy uh, straight away without waiting for medical nutrition therapy to act for two weeks. When the fasting plasma glucose and uh, uh, postprandial glucose is high, or if the woman is in the first trimester or after 30 weeks, if she has type 2 diabetes, if she's having macrosomia, or she has any vasculopathy, if she is in labor, if she is getting dexamethasone for lung maturity of the baby, then it is a straightaway indication to switch over to insulin therapy. Types of insulin, basal insulins will take care of the hepatic glucose production and control the fasting and the pre-meal values, which are the ones which is safe in pregnancy. 
in government hospitals we are getting nph otherwise uh, detemir is found to be safe and digludac uh, recently in february 2023 this has also been approved for use in pregnancy by drug controller general of india also and the bolus insulin most of the government hospitals we are using uh, regular insulin but the rapid insulins like aspart and lispro are also safe to be used and they can be given just before the meal so that hypoglycemia will not occur later on so in the rapid lispro aspart regular insulin then nph insulin and detemir are all category b and uh, as uh, we know that aspart and lispro are rapid acting they can be taken uh, with the meal onset is within 15 minutes peak effect is uh, 60 minutes one hour and duration of action is 3 to 5 hours so it is uh, very good and it does not cause hypoglycemia later on which is a problem with regular insulin or nph insulin which acts for a very long time digludec as you can see there is no peak and uh, it acts for more than 24 hours detemir also is good glargine also if the patient is already on glargine and controlled on glargine we can continue her on glargine so when we diagnose a woman with gdm or diabetes in pregnancy we admit the woman do a seven point glucose profile fasting to our post breakfast pre lunch to our post lunch pre dinner to our post dinner and at uh, midnight so if the fasting is high we can start her on uh, long uh, long acting or nph uh, insulin if the postprandial is high we can give short or rapid acting insulin just before the meal and after calculating the total dose we divide it into two third in the morning and one third in the night with a combination of two third of intermediate acting and one third of short acting insulin this is a very comprehensive simple chart which the government of india has given in the guidelines you get a pregnant woman if the target value is uh, if the 2 hour post prandial blood glucose is more than 120 then the woman needs to be put on uh, premix insulin 30 70 subcutaneous 30 minutes before meal and you can titrate the dose if it is between 120 to 160 four unit 160 to 200 six unit and more than 200 straight away go to eight units if it is less than 120 we continue with medical nutrition therapy physical exercise and if any time we keep on monitoring if any time it is one more than 120 we come back to the insulin the same has been recommended 95 is the threshold for fasting and 120 for 2 hour post the glucose the same fundamental is being repeated here so depending on whether the fasting is high or post prandial uh, glucose is high we can start them on insulin so it is very important in any, any woman on insulin we have to tell them about hypoglycemia tell not only her but also her mother in law her husband educate them about the uh, symptoms how you can prevent hypoglycemia how you can treat hypoglycemia importance of doing self monitoring of blood glucose by teaching them how to use a glucometer how to take insulin injections not to miss any meal accurate medication and careful management of exercise so these are the signs if any time blood glucose is less than 70 we say that she has hypoglycemia we need to educate the woman about early symptoms like tremors of hands sweating palpitation hunger easy fatigability headache irritability mood changes in severe cases she will have confusion abnormal behavior and sometimes they develop seizures and loss of consciousness treatment is very simple Three teaspoons of glucose in one glass of water. After taking oral glucose, she should rest and avoid any physical activity for fifteen minutes. Then we can uh, tell her to take a chapati or eat anything sweet. Uh, if glucose is not available, we can mix six uh, teaspoonful of uh, sugar in one glass of water or give her juice or anything sweet. So once the blood glucose levels are controlled, how frequently we need to monitor the blood glucose level? and which is more important the pre or the post meal values so uh, the government of india guideline says that once controlled monitor every third day fasting plasma glucose and two hours post meal and if the patient is on metformin bi weekly can be done but optimal thing is at least do fasting and three to four postprandials we can do it in a staggering manner 
we can do post breakfast one day post lunch the next day post dinner the third day a staggering approach which is also advocated by ada and figo can be used post prandial values have been found to be more associated having a positive correlation with macrosomia and adverse uh, events with the baby a word about uh, this metformin this is the uh, drug which we are very fond of using in our women having polycystic ovarian syndrome and it has been seen that this is a systematic review and meta analysis that women who uh, took pcos uh, who took metformin throughout pregnancy could deliver term pregnancy reduces the risk of early preterm labor preterm labor pregnancy complications like gdm pre eclampsia and no serious side effects but remember ada says that metformin may not be continued in pcos women after 12 weeks our indian guidelines say it should not be started before 20 weeks so advantages of metformin or oral anti diabetic agents is it's a second line if the patient is not willing or not able to take insulin stays in a remote area it is more convenient less expensive it is a mental trauma for the patient who is pregnant to uh, to come to know that she is a diabetic it is a trauma for the whole family they will say that i have eaten sugar today i have been eating sweets so i am not diabetic it is very difficult to convince them so this is a safer option uh, less monitoring is required as dr sareen said it does not cause hypoglycemia which is a very very good thing and the weight gain for the baby is also less less chances of macrosomia if it is preferred by the patient it will at least increase uh, treatment adherence and it is very useful for obese women when we add a little bit of metformin it increases insulin sensitivity and very high doses of insulin are not required there are uh, uh, metformin and glyburide are both category b drugs metformin we start in the doses of 500 mg after uh, breakfast or after dinner whichever is the heaviest meal of the uh, day and we can slowly increase it to maximum 2 grams per day Uh, the problem is that it has 1.5 to 1.7 times higher risk of preterm birth, and nearly 30 to 50 percent of the women are not going to be controlled only on metformin. And we do have to add insulin. Glyburide was the other agent. We start with 2.5 milligrams, and maximum dose is 20 milligram. But it is now gone into disrepute because it has a 2.5 times higher risk of macrosomia and also neonatal hypoglycemia. And otherwise it has a 16% failure rate and has to be substituted with uh, insulin so these are the status of the guidelines the mohfw all you can appreciate here all the guidelines recommend insulin as the first choice the uh, national guidelines recommend both can be taken during pregnancy the recent dipsy guidelines 2023 also advocate both i am sorry this is a typo error both are recommended in pregnancy australian guidelines do not recommend uh, metformin in pregnancy both acog american college and uh, of obzengaini and american diabetes association say that because metformin and glyburide are going to pass through the placenta we do not know about the long term safety and this should be told to the patient before putting the patient on any uh, anti uh, glycemic uh, oral anti glycemic agent nice guidelines also recommend both agents insulin and metformin as first line what is the regulatory status the drug controller general of india the us fda the australian guidelines do not approve metformin for use in pregnancy but the good news is the european union has just given approval to metformin for use in pregnancy throughout this is the package insert which says that metformin should not be used during pregnancy should not, it's not safe for children less than 10 years so coming a uh, word about fetal surveillance the american college has divided into two categories a mild gdm which is category 1 the women who are controlled on only medical nutrition therapy no special monitoring is required category 2 is the one who is uh, high risk and they require medication it could be metformin or insulin so uh, the uh, typical protocol for high risk pregnancy in the first trimester dating ultrasound pap a beta hcg ntnb scan uterine artery doppler for preeclampsia should be done abnormally scan 
with four chamber view outflow track three vessel should be done at 18 to 20 weeks at the time when we are doing a normally scan fetal echo is not indicated in all patients otherwise uncontrolled diabetes over diabetes previous history of uh, gca or cardiac anomaly uh, in only those patients we should do it routinely in a1 category it is not required at all and we have to serially do ultrasounds every three to four weekly to look for any fetal growth retardation, macrosomia, polyhydramnias, and uh, the usual test, daily fetal movement count, NST, biophysical profile, as uh, advocated uh, for a high-risk pregnancy should be done. Macrosomia is the most dreaded complication. Uh, fetal weight more than 90th centile or birth weight more than 4 kg or more than two standard deviation above mean is what is macrosomia in Indian population because we are smaller. So 90th centile comes out to be 3.45 kgs and both the ultrasound and clinical parameters are not very good in diagnosing this. And whenever we are giving antenatal corticosteroids for lung maturity, we need to monitor the patient. We need to admit the woman. We have to do blood sugar profiles every four hourly and also counsel the patient and be vigilant lest she develops diabetic ketoacidosis. So what time should we deliver and what should be the mode of delivery? Most Many of the private institutes are uh, think, uh, going for cesarean section, but we should aim for a vaginal delivery for these women. And although the Caucasian guidelines say that we can continue pregnancy till 41 weeks, most of our Indian babies are mature by 38 weeks. So in most of our hospitals, we are terminating pregnancy at 38 to 39 weeks. Can you please mute these? So this is what, and it is very important. As soon as the placenta is out, the glucogenic hormone source is out. So the insulin resistance come down. So most of our uh, GDM women will not require any anti-diabetic agent after delivery. We can stop that and we need to monitor fasting and postprandial for one to three days. Most of the type 2 diabetes, again, the glucogenic hormones are out and they are also breastfeeding. So there are chances that there may be hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia. So we need to monitor them and the, uh, they can be started on pre-pregnancy uh, oral anti-diabetic agent dose. For women who are on insulin, nearly 30% dose reduction will be there. And both the drugs, metformin and glibaride, can be uh, advocated during lactation because they are secreted in negligible amount and has not been found to be uh, a problem for the baby. Very, very important initiative is postpartum follow-up. And nearly as you will see here, all the guidelines recommend that these women at the dis time of discharge should be, we should reinforce that they are high chances of developing diabetes later on. Even their children have high chances of developing NCDs, non-communicable diseases later on. Say they need to come, they need to give a very good breastfeeding, uh, continue it for one year. It has been shown that breastfeeding for three months uh, uh, was able to increase the median time to diabetes progression to 12.3 years as compared to 2.3 years. So this is a very simple and easy uh, and uh, does not require any uh, cost. So this is a simple intervention to reduce their conversion or progression to type 2 diabetes. As you will see here, all the guidelines are saying that these women need to come back, follow up, follow up visit at 6 to 12 weeks. We need to tell them that they have to optimize the weight, the blood sugar. At this visit, we are again doing the WHO GTT fasting and 2-hour post-glucose test. Even if they come uh, out to be normal glycemics. They are supposed to come back every year lifelong. And if they have impaired glucose tolerance or they have diabetes, they can be referred to our physician friends. In the discharge card, we should have a marking where the both the mother and child tracking can be done as a high-risk pair. And when they are coming, the mothers are coming for immunization, we can catch them there, use the opportunity to do this glucose testing uh, for these women and tell them uh, to use contraception, decrease their weight, do exercise. And they are, you know, very sensitive at this time because they already know the complications that they have faced during pregnancy. So contraception, 
uh, is another very important thing. Risk of unplanned pregnancy outweighs the risk of any contraception. For GDM women, all contraceptive methods are safe. But we should be very careful uh, in giving estrogen containing and DMPA. These two things are thrombogenic and they are category three and four for women who have complicated diabetes or vasculopathy or having diabetes for more than 20 years. Best is our copper T, uh, uh, IUCD and barrier contraceptives, which are category one. Rest all are category two. Interconceptional care. So we start with post-conception, then the intermediate time comes and then preconceptional counseling. So this is a very, very important period where we can utilize this opportunity of reinforcing in each visit, diet, exercise, weight reduction, breastfeeding, metformin if she's having impaired glucose. Also monitor her weight, look for her waist, visceral obesity, uh, do a, a, a lipid profile, me measure her uh, glucose levels in each visit, uh, make them more sensitive for the child also. The whole family, uh, the mother-in-law and the husband should also be sensitized that all of them need to control their diet. And next pregnancy should be planned only after counseling and optimization. To conclude, maintaining euglycemia with supervised multidisciplinary care will avoid short and long-term complications for both the mother and the baby. Early diagnosis, patient education, life management, lifestyle management with medical nutrition therapy and individualizing exercise forms the backbone. And nearly 80 to 90% of the GDM women are going to can get controlled only on this. So nutrition is the most important thing. Insulin is the gold standard for treatment of diabetes in pregnancy with unparalleled, unquestionable efficacy and safety. No oral agent is FDA approved and their use is off-label, although achieving normal glycemia is the most important aim. So even metformin can be used and it's, it has even achieved regulatory approval in European Union, which is very tough to get. And metformin should be the second line approach. Counsel the woman about increased risk of preterm pregnancy. 26 to 36% uh, uh, failure rate that they may be requiring insulin. We need to tell them that it passes through the placenta and there is lack of long-term safety data for the exposed offspring. I thank you all for a very patient hearing. Excellent, Dr. Pikki. You have practically taken up all aspects of diabetes in pregnancy. In fact, we had an excellent lecture by Dr. Mohan the point is, his group of patients, when we come to pregnancy, will be only 15-16% of our clients who will be already known diabetic, where you very beautifully highlighted the importance of preconceptional care. If it is well controlled, many problems can be tackled. But the strange thing is, when there is no diabetes per se, which is going to manifest only during pregnancy, the adverse effects are still the same, which are occurring with all the hypoglycemias or all the type of diabetics. And that is why we worry quite a lot. And actually, initially in India, we did not have a policy of universal screening also. The prevalence also, and when I recall back, when we analyzed data of 70s, early 80s, yes. initially we had, we were not university screening. We were only screening women who had high risk factors, obese, excess weight gain, family history, malformations earlier, stillbirths earlier and all. And we had a prevalence of GDM of only 0.4%. Yes. Over 10 year period, by 85, it is increased to almost 4%. And currently, when we are following a policy of universal screening, we are finding almost 12 to 12% women manifest some features of gestational diabetes mellitus. We have, in fact, excellent drugs come for diabetes management, which we heard from. Dr. Mohan, all those gliptin, citagliptin, dapagliptin, liragliptin, 
but the point is safety of none of these has been documented in pregnancy only metformin has some data and permitted somewhere which you beautifully highlighted otherwise be it gdm be it over diabetes if sugars are high you do need to so given us the standard values very nicely i'm sure our audience has benefited a lot but there are some questions for you Uh, there yes, is a question that if you diagnose GDM on OGC between thirty to thirty-six weeks, will you label it as GDM? Uh, uh, the question is that if you have what, ma'am? If, if she is on high blood sugars, like on your huh. OGC criteria, between thirty to thirty-four weeks by DIPSI criteria, you find high. will you label it as uh, yes definitely she will be a case of gestational diabetes mellitus if the thresholds are more than 200 or fasting is more than uh, 126 then she will become uh, pre gestational diabetes or over diabetes so she is definitely a case of uh, hyperglycemia in pregnancy yes absolutely in fact when we follow the policy of universal screening yes we do gct for everyone around 22 to 24 weeks if yes. you do it much earlier you can miss a lot of gdm but still after that also if you are finding any of the features polyhydramnios big baby, baby excess weight gain and all it is worthwhile repeating and even if you find it as late as 36 weeks you can still label it as definitely ma'am if can she has question, any metabolic problem uh i i was okay i think somebody unmuted muted me so i don't know whether you have heard the question the question is studies on neonatal outcome studies are that a study i think you highlighted most of the complications fetal neonatal Something wrong with the mic is a question was asked before you were talking about neonatal outcome right No, your mic is not audible. Uh, no, uh, I'm not now, audible. Uh, now it is audible. And now, ma'am, I could not hear your question. Sorry, there okay. was some. Okay, I will leave that neonatal outcome because I think question was asked before you were talking about neonatal. So I'm okay. sure. it has been yeah. so Very respiratory distress question. syndrome uh, preterm deliveries then huh. hypoglycemia hypothermia hypocalcemia hyperbilirubinemia polycythemia neonatal jaundice and as the child grows in uh, uh, childhood obesity impaired glucose tolerance diabetes metabolic syndrome the whole uh, problem the of ncds comes up for the baby also okay this is something interesting now since we have so much of research going on do we have any first trimester biomarker which can predict that it may turn into gdm this woman has something like this been evaluated nisfatten is one of the biomarkers which has been evaluated the, all the biomarkers which have been done uh, in uh, uh, G, uh, diabetes they are all being also re replicated in first and early second trimester in gdm also and they are coming out to be significantly raised yeah is there any role of b12 supplement or any micronutrient supplement in prevention uh b12 as dr sarin has emphasized if we are actually we were doing a big study in lady harding and we found that folic acid levels were quite high but most of the women were have deficient in b12 so especially the woman who is going to be put on metformin or who is already on metformin for a long time 
B12 supplementation can be given, but I think it can be done for most of our women because micronutrient uh, deficiency is coming out to be in yes. big way affecting the overall growth of the baby. Just like to intervene, Dr. Mittal, for a second, Dr. Mitchell yes, probably yes, confuses yes. me with Dr. Mohan. The previous talk was by Professor Mohan, who is a diabetologist. I am a different uh, specialty, but uh, please give all compliments to Dr. Mohan for his excellent talk. Absolutely. That was excellent. Fabulous talk. With all the latest drugs. All Sir, the latest it was drugs. too good. And I came to the auditorium only so that I could hear you and see you. It was Thank really you. worthwhile. It was an excellent talk by a legend. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Preeti. Thank you very much. It was beautiful. Any yeah. other questions? I from enjoyed the your talk as well. Excellent overview on GDM. Fantastic talk. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Chandak, you have a question, please. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to continue that, you know, when usually by DIPSI or by IADPSG, this GDM diagnosis is restricted to second trimester till 28 weeks. But there are various, you know, women who are diagnosed between 30 and 36. You mentioned that they should be considered as GDM. I'm wondering what sort, if there is any study which has looked at the neonatal outcome and whether they are similar to those who have been diagnosed earlier than this period. Sir, actually all the guidelines, IADPSG and the DIPSI guidelines also and the national guidelines also say that the first trimester screening should be done. She should be tested again at 24 to 28 weeks and you are very rightly seeing, saying that many times the, lady, uh, the woman is coming to us unbooked during labor and we are doing and finding out uh, to be uh, a diabetic patient. And there is every week uh, we are having a stillbirth meeting on Saturdays and nearly 50% of the stillbirths are in women having hyperglycemia. These women have not been treated at all. They are having so much of more complications. I think Dr. Mohan sir has made so many contributions in uh, GDM also. Sir can also yeah. uh, put in. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I think the question that Dr. Chandak was asking is when the international guidelines say 24 to 28 weeks, why we should screen at the third trimester. I think Dipsy has made it very, very clear that some uh, women, and I think Professor Mittal uh, said that, and you said that, that some women can uh, can develop GDM even in the third trimester. And you very rightly made the point that even in the first trimester, we are picking up, and this is more common in South Asians. So at any time during the pregnancy, if it is not overt or pre-gestational diabetes, the values don't exceed 126 fasting or 200 after glucose and so on, it is gestational diabetes only. It can occur first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. If it occurs later, if it occurs in the third trimester, it's probably better because they have not gone through the first trimester, second, already organogenesis has taken place, up to second trimester, nothing has happened. You still cannot neglect it. At least dietary therapy should be offered, lifestyle modification should be offered. Maybe they may not need insulin and all at that time. But at any trimester, I think GDM is yes. GDM and it should be treated. And we know that the insulin requirement also increases trimester wise. In the third because trimester, the it increases till 36 weeks. Absolutely. So the requirement, the glucogenic hormones are produced at a maximum rate. So they can, if they have mild insulin resistance, probably they will manifest in the third trimester. Third, third trimester. So screening for it is not at all uh, wrong. And uh, what else do you call it? If you're diagnosing it for the first time during uh, third trimester, also you have to call it GDM only. The late on uh, and there was a FOXY study which has been published where they found that nearly 30% uh, are detected in the first trimester, 30% in the second trimester and nearly 20-26% also in the third trimester. So what Dipsy says three times testing is yes. I think, uh, I think correct. Right. Yeah. I think the Tobogam trial yes, will Dr. be Mohan. published and after the Tobogam trial is published I think, see the Question is in the first trimester when you diagnose GDM, what do you do with it? We didn't have an RCT till now, but uh, it's in New England Journal. Hopefully, it will get published soon. So okay. once the Tobacom trial is published, we'll know that the uh, that even treating GDM in the first trimester is beneficial and there's no risk. So that yes. means we should screen. And so I think yes. the guidelines may be changed. International guidelines say only 24 to 28 weeks can get changed uh, soon, saying that everybody and Dipsy has been saying it for the last 15 years. 
saying yes. that everybody from the time of first booking, because if you don't do it, then you're missing a golden opportunity to roll out pre-existing diabetes and early GDM. And the fetal programming will also occur, sir. Agar, if she is diagnosed in third trimester, as you rightly said, at least the fetal programming has not exactly. occurred. That's first right. trimester, we'll miss the bus. Yeah. The epigenetic changes would have already Indian, occurred. We have to screen first trimester. We have no to. And our PCOS patients, infertility patients, IVF patients, sir, we are getting very high number who are uh, the GDM or diabetes in the first trimester itself. So I think there is no question. In fact, they are more severe it. than the conventional GDM because yes. they're getting it early. Dr. Chandak, you have a question, please. Dr. Chandak, have you gone or you're still there? I think so, he has uh, left. Is there some audience sitting in the hall? Ma'am, very few. I just no, came no. here so that I could meet <laughs> Dr. Kapil and Dr. Sareen, but Dr. Sareen is also not here. <laughs> but it is my luck that I could see you and Dr. Mohan. I could hear his talk. Wow. Heard so much about you, sir. It was excellent you. to hear your enlightening you so talk today. Wonderful. Wonderful. You should collaborate at some point. <laughs> yes, definitely, sir. Right. So I think if there are no more questions, we can conclude the session. I don't know where is the moderator. She was supposed to introduce me and then set the ball rolling but then okay ma'am she was introducing he was introducing you but probably the uh, he was muted so he started reading your introduction and then you could not hear so you intervened in between okay. so there was I some technical I fault he I had a whole very nice so i thought your... i can introduce you and go ahead with yes. the lecture there was some confusion okay so we okay. thank Sam's and Grateful to all the, both the speakers have been excellent. It's been a nice evening spent on a Sunday. Uh, good learning. And thank you, Dr. Umesh Kapil, Dr. Sareen. Thank you. And all the other team of NAMS who have participated. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Both Dr. of Sareen. you and Madam Mittal again Dr. sometime Mesho. soon. Oh, it's good. a great honor it's for NAMS to you. have. Great honor. And Thank I do also hope you all become fellows or members or associate fellows soon. Please do uh, enrich names and we hope to work together. Thank you so much. And all those who are listening on YouTube or otherwise, please also say thank you and give your comments, give your feedback, how we can improve. And yeah, Preeti is there. Okay. And just and Jaswinder may also be there. If he's around, both of these are volunteers from Ames, uh, Preeti and Jaswinder. Good initiative. Okay, I can unmute them. Preeti. To have an audience of anywhere from two to five thousand. Otherwise, it's an effort wasted. Our yes. country, there are so many postgraduates who need to be taught the right thing. But unless yes. we bring them in the fold, and this is a very good platform where many could join huh, and benefit. Otherwise, where will they get the opportunity to, yes. to hear experts like Dr. Mohan and Piki? Tell me. So let them have this, but they are not here. That's what I can see. Yeah, Jaswinder is the president of the RWA from the Ames, New Delhi. He has been trying. And Preeti is our young master. Uh, she is the best compere that we have. We have to find a better way of uh, working and reaching out and me and Umesh are working on it. But anyway, over to... Uh, Sir, if we can get this information about what lecture is going to be and it can be circulated in the residence itself, also in the our hospitals, I think that will increase the audience if there's no problem in that. If the link can be shared, we can share the okay. link with all the residents. They would love to hear Dr. Mohan. I'm yes. sure. Thank so you. We'll improve. Okay. Thank you. Preeti. Thank, yes, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, thank I you. Another commitment. I had initially regretted, but when I saw Dr. Mohan is speaking, then I said, let me join. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mohan sir, Sunita ma'am and uh, Pinky ma'am. I would now like to request uh, Professor Sarin sir to uh, tell the concluding remarks. Well, we are privileged. 
but we our reach has to increase i see many of my friends and colleagues here from all across india please try to help us do more it's our commitment to navigate medicos at every level for a better skill better learning we'll do better next time thank you and very grateful to the speakers and thanks to the volunteers thank and you. thanks to mesh thanks to mesh and the whole team and dr Viradhar and everyone. Umesh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Bye-bye. So thank I you, sir. Thank you. So I would now like uh, to request uh, Professor Umesh, sir, to present a, a memento to our speakers, uh, Dr. Mohan, sir, and uh, Dr. Pinky, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also to our chairperson, Dr. Sunita Mithal, ma'am. <laughs> As uh, Mohan sir and uh, Sunita Mittal ma'am are online, we will be just showing it uh, on Thank screen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and it will be uh, sent to you, sir, by uh, Thank post, you so much. Uh, and to you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. And I would like to invite uh, Professor Ajay Sood, sir, uh, for presenting, uh, for providing the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you so much. It is really my honor to uh, thank the eminent speakers for this evening, Professor Mohan, sir, and uh, Dr. Piki Saxena. We are really grateful uh, to you for sparing your valuable time and sharing your experience of perhaps decades with our participants. Thank you very much, sir. And we look forward for your support in future also. As our president has said, we want to make it a weekly or fortnightly activity. And we'll try to cover all the medical colleges and other institutions, including the DNB institution. Thank you very much for, uh, for your Thank you, sir. Value. Good night. We are also grateful to uh, Madam Sunita Mittal, ma'am for uh, being with us and sharing this session. And of course, Professor Sreen has been a source of uh, encouragement for all of us here for uh, uh, this series of lecture, which we are finishing today. In fact, we started this series on, uh, on January, 21st of January, and we have tried to cover some of the emergency situations as uh, requested by the participants. We had a, a training need assessment uh, for FOMA, which was sent to the registered participant large number of them are PG students from medicine and surgical specialties. So during this series, we have tried to cover uh, emergency situation like first session was on uh, a patient with chest pain and uh, pneumonia. Uh, then we covered liver failure, how to manage a, approach a patient with liver failure and uh, renal failure. Then next session was on how to approach an unconscious patient or patient who has poisoning. Then we covered head injury and uh, spinal trauma. And today we are really honored to have the eminent personality in the area of diabetes, Professor Mohan and uh, Dr. P.K. Saxena. Mm -hmm. So with this, we end the first series, which we started. And uh, we request all the participants, including our PG student and uh, our eminent faculty and uh, other members who, are, uh, who have attended this session to give their feedback. We are going to send a formal email request and we look forward for your valuable suggestion for improving the next series, which we are planning to start from the month of April. So with these words, I will like to thank uh, of all the uh, dignitaries, uh, eminent speakers, uh, and the chairperson who have been associated with us for this series for their valuable contribution and support to NAMS. We are grateful to our president, our secretary, our council members, and our other NAMS family members who have been present and encouraging us from time to time. Our great uh, big thanks to our team from AIMS. Special thanks to uh, the, these members, including Dr. Preeti, Dr. Deswan, uh, Dr. Piki, Dr. Dinesh, and Dr. Manali, who are here and who have been working us, working with us. And the NAMS team comprised of Mr. Ravi, uh, Mrs. Um, um, Madh Madhuri Madam is here. She was working in the background. Administrative part was being looked after by Mr. Nirmal. 
And of course, uh, monitoring was done by our president and our secretary. So with these words, once again, I thank you all. And we look forward for your valuable support for the next series, which we are going to start from April. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I declare today's academic session closed. Thank you all. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Good evening.